Welcome to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, a podcast about the United States and the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm your host, Michael Patrick Cullinane. One of the best things about producing the show is learning new things about the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. The scholarly community is always researching, publishing new texts that remind us of things that we've missed. And today, we're talking about a scandal, a scandal that we missed, and one that's as big as Credit Mobilier, the Whiskey Ring, or the 20th century's Teapot Dome. I'm guessing that few of us know about it. It's called the Star Root Scandal, and it plagued the Republican Party from the roots to its branches. And if you don't know what a Star Root is, don't worry, I have Professor Sean Peters on the show to explain everything. Sean is a teacher at the Center for Educational Opportunity at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Sean teaches one of the coolest classes at UW, an interdisciplinary class on narratives of justice and equality in multicultural America. It's better known as the Wire class because it uses the television show as a way of exploring contemporary American life. Now, I wish my classes in college were that topical and grappled with life imitating art, imitating life. Sean has also written several other books on religion and American history, such as Judging Jehovah's Witnesses, When Prayer Fails, Faith Healing Children and the Law, and The Cantonsville Nine, a story of faith and resistance in the Vietnam era. So he is an exceptional author and scholar. Today, however, we are here to discuss the 19th century, the postal system, and a scandal that rocked the presidencies of James Garfield and Chester A. Arthur. Welcome to the show, Sean. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And I'll start with a confession. Before I read the book, I had no idea what a star root was. And I'm supposed to be a historian of this period, so I'm embarrassed and but there might be a few other listeners out there that might not know what a star root is either. Can you just simply tell us what they are and take us on maybe a tour through one of these star roots? Sure. So, and I have to, you know, before I had gotten into this book, I was not an expert on, you know, uh, 19th century American postal uh, routes and services and stuff. And I had to the extent that I had thought about this stuff, I had thought about the Pony Express kind of looms very large in the historical imagination. Pony Express actually was relatively brief. It was great. It was a very romantic kind of thing. Um, the star roots actually were much more comprehensive. And essentially, if I could just boil it down, um, the Postal Service in the 19th century, especially in the Plains and the Far West, um, it was it was hard going. Um, there weren't... Um, conventional roads as we know them now, there was spotty rail service. So just delivering the mail to remote outposts, especially sort of the mining communities, right? These mining towns, which just spring up like literally overnight and have, you know, two, two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 people. And suddenly they needed mail service and star routes existed. They were basically um, the post office would contract to individuals and say, well, okay, we're going to pay you a particular amount of money to deliver mail between two points. Let's say, I don't know, Santa Fe and Laramie, Wyoming, a particular number of times per week at a particular speed. Um, and then it was up to you as the independent mail contractor to figure out how to do that. And sometimes it was pretty straightforward. Um, sometimes it wasn't as straightforward as you might think because of the terrain, because of indigenous populations. It was a, a kind of a helter-skelter situation. We think of things now being fairly uniform in terms of uh, these kinds of deliveries and this kind of service. But it was pretty It was pretty random whether or not a, town, a particular town got any kind of mail service was somewhat random, um, who bid on them. The, the, it was just, yeah, it was kind of helter-skelter. So the uh, the star, uh, the points of the star denoted certainly certainty, celerity, and security. Um, and that wasn't always um, true. That, that was the promise of these routes. Uh, but whether or not the mail got delivered um, was sort of up to the contractor. Sometimes these contractors were um, experienced people who had a real dedication to 
um, delivering the mail properly. Sometimes they didn't. If that seems like kind of a rambling explanation, it's because it was a very rambling enterprise um, and the oversight of it was relatively lax. And people who wanted to make a fast buck realized that this was a way to do it. Um, there just wasn't that kind of you know, scrupulous um, regulation of these routes. So that is a great answer. It's all. It also raises a ton of other questions. And you've alluded to that idea about who is control, who's controlling these routes. And I guess the real question here is, how do the routes get purchased by investors? And and I suppose how does this then all lead to the scandal that's going to emerge later on uh, when uh, later on in the 1880s? Sure. So the post office would just advertise. They would send out circulars and 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 various other means uh, to just let people know that we're um, here are 25 routes that you can bid on and we'll give the contract to the lowest bidder. And people, these contractors realized fairly early that the move was to just submit a preposterously low bid um secure the contract and then go back to the post office and say hey you know what it turns out that i can't actually deliver the mail um for the price that i agreed to so how about um changing it so there were this it was this process called expedition um and in some ways it it made a certain amount of sense because these are often very remote areas in the, uh, you know, Oregon territory and, you know, um, Colorado, where the contractors had never been. They just looked at the map. Um, so on one hand, it's sort of taking it at face value. You could say, I, I bid on this thing. I didn't really realize that it was going to take more animals, more men, uh, and more effort. So I need to kind of uh, come back to you and ask for twice the amount of money. The problem was that when everybody did that with every contract all the time, and it was always an upward adjustment that they asked for from the post office. To my knowledge, no one ever, the post office never said, hey, I think it turns out that actually that this we can adjust your, your contract downward because it turns out this is a pretty easy route. You don't need as many animals. You don't need as many men. It was always, and, and often uh, a fantastic upward adjustment, you know, 17 times the um, the initial value of the contract. And also these rings or combinations would come together of contractors where they would essentially collude um, to drive out. If there was a scrupulous, honest contractor, you would get together with men in your ring and you would say, okay, we're all just going to submit low bids and force this person out. Another thing that would happen is if you failed in your contract um, and never even tried, let's say, to deliver the mail because you were part of a ring and you just wanted to scam the government, then the, the contract would go to the next lowest bidder on the contract. So if there were 10 of you, <laughs> then eventually um, someone would get the contract and then you could split the proceeds. So it was, it, it wasn't a, like a super sophisticated scheme, um, but it was very lucrative and it went on for a really long time. It wasn't just a, a couple of guys over a period of one or two years. It was many contractors over, um, over at least, I'd say, uh, as long as there were these star routes in the far west and in the plains that, that this kind of swindling went on. And your book deals with one ring in particular, one ring that puts a bid out for dozens of star routes, doesn't expect to get anywhere near as many as they wind up getting. And then they're sort of left in the position where, OK, we've got to fulfill these contracts. We can go back and ask for more more money, but, you know, we're, we're going to try and give this a go. And, and what happens? Yeah, so there's a... Um a ring or a group of men that are kind of loosely affiliated with um, Stephen Dorsey, uh, who over the course of the story, he is a senator from Arkansas and then leaves office and remains a 
prominent Republican um, throughout the 1880 election. Um, and uh, a guy named Tom Brady, who was the second assistant postmaster general. And, and, and he's really crucial to this because you can't, you need someone on the inside uh, to go along with this scheme. If you're going to, you can't fiddle with the contracts um, just as the, as the contractor has to, you know, have agreement from the post office. And so Dorsey gets together and it's, it, it was really hard to get at um, who was involved when, I think it's one of the reasons why the story has eluded people for a long time is because it was, um, everybody knew that there was a lot of bad stuff going on involving a lot of people, but it was kind of um, like nailing jelly to the wall in terms of, okay, exactly which contracts when involving whom, but more or less um, Stephen Dorsey and, oh, you know, seven or eight people, uh, including his brother, his brother-in-law and some other folks, they get together and they say, well, we're going to bid on a bunch of these contracts and then we'll figure out a way to make some money. Um, and eventually that there are, and I say this in the book that when we talk about the Star Root scandal, there were lots of guys involved who don't even appear in this book. I focused on Dorsey and his ring and these two trials because they were kind of the 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 tip of the iceberg. Like they're the most prominent thing that people knew about. Um, the Garfield administration cared about them. The Arthur administration cared about them. But there were tons of this was just um, there are. 10 other books that could be written about all of the other contractors doing stuff like this. And it was hard for me. I really had to just pick. And I said, I'm, I'm just going to go with Dorsey and um, this combination of, of guys that he works with. And eventually they were put on trial for like 19 suspicious contracts that they had entered into and had colluded with Tom Brady and other people in the post office with. But I, I will admit to anybody, if if other people know lots about the Star Roots and about this this world, um, there's tons of other stuff out there. I just had to, I I, I could have written a <laughs> 400,000 word, mm -hmm. a multi volume kind of remembrance of things past type of work that no one would have read. So I sort of boiled it down to this one group of men who really they're the most prominent, they're the most interesting. Um, and the the side stories involving them were really the richest and most interesting, I think, to general readers of this period and just historians of this period. There's just lots of, I, I love a good scandal and I love um, bid rigging. I think it's cool. Um, but I really just, I had to focus on kind of the biggest fish and Dorsey, uh, and and Brady were the two biggest fish. So the book is is about them. It's about these two trials involving them. Uh, but there was tons of other stuff going on. Okay, so I get why you picked Stephen Dorsey. Um, I mean, he you know he's fascinating. He's a fascinating character. Your book goes into great de detail about how he gets James Garfield elected in a really tight race in 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 1880 and. and how afterwards he lobbies hard for cabinet members. But in the end, Garfield picks Wayne McVeigh for attorney general and Thomas James for postmaster general, both of whom Dorsey didn't want. So how does their appointment to the cabinet change things for Dorsey? It changes things a lot for Dorsey. So, you know, as you mentioned, Dorsey, he had left the Senate and becomes a kind of, for the Republican Party, becomes an all-around fixer. Um, in the years between when he leaves the Senate and the, and the 1880 election. He's a stalwart, really, and really wants, um, basically backs, um, I, I think, probably wanted Grant for a third term in 1880 or another stalwart. And he was a, um, you know, they wound up with Garfield um, and like a good loyal Republican, I mean, Dorsey said, okay, he's our guy. I'm going to do what I can do. And he goes to Indiana and Indiana is, it's a pivotal state. There's just a lot of electoral votes. And 
Dorsey does the things that people did in the 19th century to, you know, he hands out money and suppresses the vote. You know, they and both sides did this. So I don't think that Dorsey was any better or worse than anybody else. But really, um, I wouldn't say that he won the election for Garfield, but he was a pretty the stuff that he did in Indiana was pretty important. And and Garfield recognized this, and the party recognized it. It's weird. Um I write about those in the book. There's a great party that's given at Delmonico's uh, in New York in February of 1881 after the election. Um, Grant is there. Uh, Arthur is there. Uh, Garfield isn't. So this is Garfield. This is at the, the interregnum. It's Garfield is the president-elect and, and Arthur is the vice president-elect. Garfield, I think, knows better than to show up at this party. But Arthur goes and they make jokes about how har 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 thanks uh um Stephen Dorsey for the uh for the work that you did in Indiana and yet this is at the very time as you mentioned that this is a time and I'm not I do, I do not claim to be a historian of the Republican party uh in this period but it's just like incredible factionalism um more or less between these blocks, you can call them for the sake of simplicity, you know, so the stalwarts and the half breeds. Those are oversimplifications. But Garfield comes in and he's got a party that's basically, a, and he knows this, like he was the compromise candidate. They saddled him with Arthur, who the idea of Arthur being put on the ticket is kind of, it's still incredible to me to think about it. But um, he's really up against it because I think he realized. On the one hand, he wants to keep the party together, but on the other hand, he can't just placate the stalwarts forever. Um, and people like Conkling, for instance, you know, he's got to sort of stand up. Um, and so he's in this weird position where he's indebted to to Dorsey quite a lot for the 1880 election. Um, but he realizes that something has to be done about the star roots and the, there needs to be a thorough investigation of it. Um, and to his credit, um, he kind of takes the makes the hard choice and says, yeah, we're, I'm going to appoint a special prosecutor um, and we're going to get into it. And Dorsey <laughs> responded as one might expect he was furious he was furious over many many things including as you mentioned the cabinet um james being appointed postmaster general and mcveigh being appointed uh attorney general um but those those and he knew that those two appointments they were generally considered to be kind of reputable um objective men i think he realized that he was going to be in for a hard time if they joined the cabinet and in fact it turned, I mean, they had this dinner for Dorsey in February of 1881 before the inauguration. And, you know, this is back in the old days when they inaugurated in March. Um, and by March and April, he's being investigated by a special prosecutor. And the, and the special prosecutor isn't appointed specifically to investigate Dorsey, but it's just sort of, hey, get to the bottom of the star root business. And everybody knows by that point that Dorsey was the guy who was um, doing shady things. So who's the investigator and, and what do they find, in, at least initially? So it's funny that they, they um, there's a guy named William Cook who is appointed as special prosecutor in He's um <laughs> he's he's kind of a not an especially reputable uh attorney in Washington and and McVeigh is McVeigh is the attorney general and they sort of asked, you know, why did you appoint this guy? He's kind of a shady critic critic uh character. And McVeigh says, Well, it's on the theory of using a thief to catch a thief, and that his disreputable associations will help us kind of get to the bottom of the scandal. And one of the stories in the book um, that I, I tried to put together is this, there is this government team that's appointed and there's just the, 
the battling that goes on within this team, including William Cook. So there had been a special prosecutor appointed uh, during the whiskey ring scandal. Uh, but this is basically the second time a special prosecutor had ever been appointed. Um, so it's an unusual circumstance. Uh, and people aren't quite sure what to, you know, who does he, does he report to the attorney general? Does he appoint to the, does he report to the district attorney of Washington, D.C., who is basically a federal, right, because it's a um, federal territory? Uh, who does he report to? Um, so that was... Um, while Grant or uh, while Garfield had set this in motion, and I think had done the honorable thing, um, it turned out that the team that was assembled to prosecute these cases, it was just a madhouse. They were no one trusted anybody. They all accused each other of wrongdoing, and that to me was one of the fun things in the book was just yeah figuring out what had happened with this team of of prosecutors because and this is a time when legal practice is different you know people um, you didn't have to go to law school you could just read for law um there wasn't you know cle training or you didn't specialize it's just like you found some lawyers and did the best that you could um and it was it was very much a mixed uh, bag and they all accused everybody else of wrongdoing like all of the prosecutors um with the except interestingly there were two democrats who wound up being part of it um and you would have thought that the republican administration would not have appointed democrats but they wanted to bring in some democrats to give the the veneer of impartiality and the democrats who were involved actually did quite well there was this guy dick merrick um who they apparently were People didn't have problems with the Democrats, but the Republicans, the infighting within the prosecution team really reflected the infighting within the party at large at that time. So the the, the, the investigators, they take about a year to to gather evidence. And what's the most damning of it? What's the what's the worst thing for for Dorsey that comes out particularly? Well, yeah, so th there had been investigation. So. This is so we're to, where we are now in the story is the spring of 1881. Garfield has been inaugurated. He appoints a special prosecutor. There had been multiple congressional investigations in the 1870s leading up to this that had uncovered various things involving Dorsey and others. Uh, and the New York Sun also. Um, had investigated for a while. So they they had, they weren't starting from scratch. Um, there was plenty of material, but they had to kind of boil down and synthesize all of the stuff. And it, it the the evidence was some of the evidence was just circumstantial. They just looked at these roots and said there's no possible way, only through wrongdoing could this obscure root with, I mean, some of them had, you know, like $4 worth of mail sent over six months, but the contract was worth, you know, several thousand dollars, right? Uh, so a lot of it was just circumstantial, but part of it was eventually one of the men, they knew that they had to get someone within the ring to talk. And eventually they found there was this sort of, um, uh, Dorsey's factotum was this guy Montfort Erdl. And eventually they got to Erdl and he gave an affidavit and he said, Yeah, look, this is I'll let he was like the bookkeeper. And he said, This is this is what this is how it went down. This is how we manipulated the contracts. We gave um uh Tom Brady, right, who was the second assistant postmaster. We uh Dorsey gave him some money, and they that was in some ways the smoking gun. In the spring of 1881, they had this affidavit, affidavit from Rudel, uh, where he he just implicated everybody. Um, I mean, Sean, it does sound a little bit like, you know, modern day scandals. The bookkeepers and the lawyers spill the beans. I mean, it doesn't sound too dissimilar, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's and it's that's the way. Right. Is that you flip you you find somebody lower and then you flip them and they because they didn't the government didn't care about Montfort Rural. They wanted to get Dorsey and Brady. Um 
But then Rudel uh, retracted his this explosive affidavit. He retracted it, and he went back and forth over the course of these two trials. Um, at first, he admitted wrongdoing and and helped cooperated, and then he retracted, and then he won. So his his testimony, which I think he was basically being truthful when he spilled the beans about the ring and he, he detailed all of the things and he, there are many of these um, shady things that they had done during these previous congressional investigations. He said at one point, yeah, we, uh, I kept a parallel set of books in case the investigator showed up on my doorstep. Um, very credible stuff that he said. And then, yeah, you know, Dorsey got to him and he changed his mind and went back and forth. Um, and so that became kind of the story of the case where it was, there was a ton of circumstantial evidence. There were unreliable witnesses um, and a general, I think, vibe in the nation's capital where they're just, it was really hard to convict federal employees of anything. Um, and I think that we just hadn't gotten there historically um, I don't even know if we're there yet, right? If you looked at, at the Mueller investigations, I, I don't know that we're there quite yet, but it was a hard sell going before a jury in Washington and saying, well, we've anybody can look at this um, kind of mosaic of facts and these contracts and how they changed. And I can look at it and we can look at it from from the perspective that we have now, we say, yeah, of course, there's something really bad happening. But at the time, um, not so much. It was hard. And the, the prosecutors, their case was a jumble also. Yeah, I want to get to the indictments and to the trial. But before we do that, I wonder if you could tell us about the court of public opinion, because obviously there's going to be two court cases and we'll, we'll, I want to talk about those. But what does the public think? Uh, you know, and I mean, I, I don't know if we can tell what the public thinks exactly, but what can we glean from the press that the public was thinking? I, boy, in general, and this is hard, right? Because you're looking, you know, if you look at the, um, there are Republican papers, there are different kinds of Republican papers, there are Democratic papers. In general, on the whole, I would say, and there's no polling or anything at this point, but um, everybody knows that, or everyone thinks i think that something happened in that um stephen dorsey um was part of it i think that that was the general consensus and i think that's why garfield acted as he did i mean he's a new president he's got he's trying to you know he's got um blaine and conkling he's got to deal with all this other stuff and this is not necessarily a fight that he wants to pick but um every paper that you pick up it's just kind of, it's on the front page and there were very few people defending Dorsey and Brady except for Brady himself <laughs> Brady owned a newspaper uh in Washington called the National Republican and of course the National Republican staunchly defended I, I, well, I'm sure pure coincidence but Tom Brady's own newspaper um you know, boisterously, vigorously defended him as well. But public opinion, I think, and this this is part of the broader import of these cases is that with this is coming off this um, you know, Mark Summers had called this the era of good seal era of good, good stealings in the 1870s. You had the whiskey ring scandal, the, the custom house scandal, you name it. There were just all of these scandals. And I, one of the things I argue in the book, and I, I didn't want to oversell it, but I think it's true, is that the Starroot scandal is the, it's a little bit of a tipping point that they're just, the public has become just so fed up with um, these nonstop government scandals. Um, and it's a little of the, the, pardon the cliche, it's sort of the straw that broke the camel's back uh, for something like civil service reform, where People just said, look, enough is enough. You have a senator and a, a high-ranking post office official lining their pockets. Everybody knew about it. No one did anything. When is it going to stop? And I think that um, it's part of what frustrated people about the trials 
was that there wasn't this, it seemed pretty obvious that something bad had happened, but we all know that that doesn't, you still have to prove your case in court. It does make uh, James Garfield emerge as a fairly credible and virtuous president. I mean, you know, for someone with such a short term in office, he comes out of this story as someone that was willing to, you know, prosecute or, or you know, inform the, the Justice Department to prosecute. So I think that's fascinating. But let, let's let's turn to the trial. The, the the first trial begins in the spring of 1882. How does that play out? Well, it's a hot mess, as we might say. Like all of this, really, isn't it? Yeah, the whole thing is one big hot mess. So it's uh, hard to write about. But um, the government just has too many. There are too many defendants and too many roots. And there's just the government real and too many lawyers in the, on the government's team, right? Um, and the government really struggles to put forward a tidy case that um, can just make an impression on a jury. So there's the government gets sort of lost in the minutia of these contracts. And there's this question about um, petitions and, and whether or not um, people in these small towns in the in the plains in the West had actually petitioned for these routes. And that's one of the things that the defendants argued was, hey, look, you know, the people of Mitchell, Oregon, here's a uh, here's this petition with all these names on it. Of course, there needed to be a star route in this place. You know, why, who could argue with that? Um, the government argued, I think, convincingly, that a lot of these petitions were fraudulent. Um, and it there were things like that, that if you, I, I read, there are two trials, and I don't even want to think about how many pages of trial testimony, but it was a lot of detail, uh, mind numbing detail. And um, I think that the government didn't do itself any favors. There were people in the government team who argued they had, they decided on nine, the 19 like most suspicious routes. Um, there were people in the government team who were like, no, we should only, let's just focus on like one or two. Um, and I think that that was probably wise. That that would have been a good counsel to follow. And the defendants are um, have their own like wide array of legal ta uh, talent. There's someone says that the, the, the first trial between the prosecution and the defense, the greatest assemblage of legal talent ever you have people like um Robert Green Ingersoll um who we remember him now as this um great free thinker um uh, the great agnostic but he was a fantastic lawyer and orator he kind of leads the defense team um and they just go to war uh it's a what you would expect a lot of lawyers a lot of evidence um the defendants, for the most part, uh, only one defendant testifies at the first trial, this guy named Harvey Vale, and that was a big mistake. He said some things in the course of his testimony that he believed that he hadn't done anything wrong, and um, he was dumb. He never should have testified. Um, so it just, it kind of goes on and on, and it, 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 it's, you could see in retrospect, the jurors are exhausted. Um, they're also probably corrupt um, as well. There's lots of jury tampering that's going on. Um, so yeah, it was um, not satisfactory. And the result? They're acquitted. Um, and, you know, there are multiple ballots and some, um, well, I let me rephrase that. Um, most of them are acquitted. Um, interestingly, Monfort Wordle, who I mentioned before, is um, is there are two who actually are convicted, but the government itself asks for that the ver that verdict to be set aside because um, there's no way that because it's a conspiracy. Um, you can't have one person in a conspiracy be guilty, one or two people. Um, the government basically says, hey, look, you can't, you can't convict like the bookkeeper and not 
convict his boss. You can't not convict Stephen Dorsey or Tom Brady. So the verdict, it's a basically a, a catastrophe for the government and even the small victory for the government, the government to its credit asked the judge to just set aside those those guilty verdicts against two of the defendants. And they they have the there's a do-over, basically. Well, there's a do-over because, well, the famous saying, it's not the crime, but it's the cover-up. Right. The, the do-over is because of all the jury tampering, right? I mean, how likely is it that the jury is actually tampered with and that, you know, witnesses are coerced and how, how crooked is the trial? It's 100% likely that there was jury tampering. <laughs> there is no doubt that there was. And the story of the jury tampering is super complicated there were uh, charges and counter charges and i to this day have a hard time remembering sort of who did what to whom but um there's no doubt that that the jurors were um were tampered with but i will say that there were plenty of people who believed that including people who had been associated with the government who said look even even if there hadn't been tampering, they, they would have been acquitted because the government's case was so bad. I think that that's probably true. So both things can be true. There could have been jury tampering, but it also could have been that the government also just put on a bad case. Well, so let's get to that. So how does it go from the first trial, acquittal, suddenly there's a second trial in 1883? Well, I shouldn't say suddenly. None of this is sudden, but there is a second trial in 1883. Right. And so by this point, also, Garfield has been assassinated and Arthur is is president and Arthur comes in. Um, nobody believes in Chet Arthur when he becomes president. There's just like zero. The, the Republic, no, the Republican Democrat, no one really believes that he uh, is deserves to be president or is really up for the job. And he says, hey, I've got to if I have any chance at all to even be nominated in 1884, um, we've got to go back and we've got to try to do this again. He, Arthur is seen as the sort of consummate machine politician. He had been part of the, the Conkling machine in New York. He had been collector of the Port of New York. He's just like Mr. Patronage and um, civil service abuse. And so he realized they had to, if he had any chance, they had to do it again. And also there had been, the, the timing of all, this, of all this does matter, there had been an 1882 off-year election in which uh, the Democrats really murdered the, the Republicans, specifically on, um, on civil service reform and patronage and stuff. So Arthur said, hey, look, we've got we've to go back and, and try this again. And to his credit, Arthur, uh, I think, acquitted himself reasonably well in all of this he uh, everyone expected him to drop the whole thing when he came in um and he did not do that um but unfortunately it was just the the second trial is just is more or less a repeat of the first trial in terms of it's overcomplicated there's too much evidence uh the prosecutors can't figure out a neat way and you would think that they had learned their lesson from the first trial um but they didn't really learn their lesson at all they were just like we have to go back and we have to uh and it's sort of just like when you i don't know sometimes i've, I've been in arguments like this where i just i have the facts and i have to spew forth all of the facts and that in retrospect was not the uh was not the best route and it's still it's still not compelling, is it? Nope, not at all. It it and it, but again, and I, I think it's important to know. And you you're wise to point this out. There is, um, there's the literal court in Washington. There's the court of public opinion, and I do think by the end of the second trial, everyone sort of knows that the, there had been corruption. Uh, and that the government needed to reform the civil service system in part to stop this. Um, so it's it's a, a sort of a lost the battle won the war ish 
situation where then the second trial also ends in acquittals, but it helps to set in motion. And I, I didn't want to overstate this in the book that I, it's not like there's this now there's a golden age of reform and the progressive era starts and there's good government and, you know, good triumphs over evil. It's not like that at all, but there is, it's not hard to look at this and say, wow, the, you know, civil service act, <laughs> the, the, there is a direct line between the star root case and that civil service act. And the Civil Service Act wasn't, it didn't do a ton at the time. It, I think it only affected like 12% of federal employees, but it was a symbolic moment that helped uh, usher in, I think, the general ethos of some progressive reforms um, that followed. And that's why I think that's what I think that this these cases matter. Um, just, I don't know, just like an obscure legal case involving some postal routes and then carpetbagger senators from Arkansas. I'm not, that's cool. But um, the significance, I think, is that it's, it just, um, there's an inflection point, I think, uh, in the way these things are handled and thought about. And I think that the Star Root scandal, um, for whatever reason, has just been like completely ignored by everybody for a really, really, really long time. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that the Postal Service as well, or the Post Office, becomes the center, the focal point of all of these uh, civil service reforms, right. not just examinations for uh, fourth class postal officers, in, you know, in, in, in the middle of the plains, but also for investigations into political corruption in the way that uh, politics operated in the 19th and early 20th century. I was wondering if the story tells us anything as well about public-private partnerships. Well, that's interesting. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I mean that the the star routes are purchased by private enterprise mm -hmm. that are, are are working for the you know for the government. And, and yeah. does this tell us something about the nature of how that begins to change in the U.S. as well? I think so. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, it was difficult. The government just wasn't the government as we know it. Um, in the 90s, it just wasn't as big and, and the Postal Service didn't have as much. It, 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 there needed to be something like this. Um, but I think your point is well taken that it, it illustrated the dangers of just giving private contractors a pile of money and saying, well, we trust you, yeah, do your best and, and come back and do the work. Again, this is a, this is a worldview. We think about it now and every government agency has an inspector general and all of the stuff. And that just was not the way it worked back then. Um, and this is how we got there. This is how we got there through things like the Star Root scandal, where it just became clear you had, um, you know, members of Congress and, and contractors and people in the Postal Service, everybody was sort of ha had their hand in the till. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that the rise of the administrative state in some ways comes from the understanding that the, the, you know, the government needs to act more efficiently and with uh, greater care and diligence to make sure these uh, these things work themselves out. Uh, look, I, I have a ton more questions that I could ask you. We're limited with how much time we've got, but I think you said it best when you said this is like nailing jelly to the wall. This is a really complicated story. And if the author of a book about this story says it's like nailing jelly to the wall, you can imagine <laughs> I, like, this is why it's obscure. But it's also really, really important. This ranks up there with Credit Mobilier, with the whiskey ring, which you mentioned. I mean, with Teapot Dome. This is this is one of the big scandals in American history. And Sean, your book does an amazing job of bringing all of the weird and wild facets of it to life. So I can't thank you enough for uh, for sharing your time with me. and. Uh, and, and I think the book is going to be a great success. Great. Thanks. I hope. Yeah. Jelly, maybe that should have been the sub. Colin, nailing jelly to the wall. Uh, but yeah, thanks for having me. Always great to, to talk with a uh, fellow historian about this period. Well, that's all we have time for. Thanks for listening. You can follow the Gilded Age and Progressive Era on Twitter or on my website, michaelpatrickcullinane.com. Please consider subscribing or reviewing the podcast wherever you listen because it really makes a big difference and helps direct others to the show. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode.